watching The Producer's Room, a streaming web series featuring the creators behind the hit songs of today's music industry. Songwriters, music producers, and artists discuss their creative process as well as examining current issues and technologies in today's rapidly changing music business. Your host is producer, songwriter, and educator, Dave Tuff. Welcome to The Producer's Room. Welcome to this episode of The Producer's Room. I'm your host, Dave Tuff. So excited for our guest today, Jason Lenning. We're coming to you from The Compound. Once again, The Producer's Room is a show that delves into the creative process behind the hit songs of today. Real quick, let me tell you about Jason's background. Jason Lenning has been an active producer, multi-instrumentalist, composer, mixer, and engineer, contributing to over 350 albums. The diverse range of artists he's worked with include George Jones, Erasure, Matt Carney, Guster, Bill Frizzell, and Allison Krauss. Jason has won two Grammy Awards as an engineer and was nominated for the Best Engineer Award in 2008. Without further ado, thank you so much for having us, Jason. We really appreciate you for being here. giving some of your valuable time up to the producer's room and sharing your story with folks. My pleasure. And um, let's go ahead and get started. Obviously, it's a great studio here, and, uh, and you do a lot of your work from home, but I know you were telling me you worked on a recent record where you had traveled to Asheville, North Carolina. And before we get into your background, just tell us about your creative process in, in today's industry. I know a lot of our, our viewers are you know, doing things from their home studio on Pro Tools. You know, do we need large studios anymore? How are you, um, what's your creative workflow? And maybe you could use this latest project as an example. Um, it changes with every project. It's all, you know, depending yeah. on the artist and the songs and what yeah. you're trying to build, it, it's always different. We, that record was for a band called Good Old War mm -hmm. from Philadelphia, and um, we chose to go to Asheville because um, the band uh, is a small band, and they wanted to, they don't, they didn't have, at the time, they didn't have a bass player mm -hmm. or a drummer. Um, it's two guys with guitars, and, and uh, so we needed to hire a bass player and a drummer, and, mm -hmm. and the people that I, I brought in for that um, are from Nashville, and the band was going to come down to Nashville, and 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 our budget was is was pretty tight, and so I thought we might, if we could really lock everybody into a, a longer day, mm -hmm. we would get more work done. Sure, and which is hard to do in Nashville if, right. if everybody's got families and you're mm -hmm. at home, and and so it made more sense to get everybody out of town for a few days. And Echo Mountain Studios in Asheville is a place that. Um, I had heard great things about and then liked a lot of the records that came out of there. Yeah. Had a lot of friends who worked there and so Was that the Avid Brothers? Was that where I they were? Believe you know? they did yeah, do some more stuff there, there. yeah. Um, and uh, so that just made a lot of sense and um, it was affordable mm -hmm. and and it, you know, Asheville's four and a half hours away, so yeah. we could get there and focus a day on so. the work and Yeah, so we I think we tracked that whole album in four days. Wow. And wow. I mean basics, and then mm -hmm. and then came back home and 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 between here and then the band did some work in Philadelphia where they're from, kind of finished all the overdubs and editing. So even that in itself, I find fascinating because the band's in another city. So did they send you work tapes or demos before you guys got to Asheville, or how did you work? They had come down here twice. Okay. To uh, to write and to brainstorm about okay. the record. I mean, originally they came down just to write and to meet, and then they made another trip that was more of a writing trip. And after that trip, it, it felt so good, we decided that we would um, mm -hmm. make the record together. And and so from there, it was kind of a lot of emails and phone calls mm -hmm. and sending demos around. Yeah. Um, and did you, and you seem, just looking through your discography, you seem like you wear a lot of hats. You're writing, you're engineering, you're producing. Uh, what what did you do on that record? Did you produce or engineer? I, I was hired to produce it, mm -hmm. and and I wrote on about a little less than half of okay. it. Okay, and um, the, and I mean inevitably there's going to be engineering, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't. I, I got somebody else to engineer mm -hmm. the basic tracks, and I hired another mixer. For, well, I should give some names because there's so many talented sure, people. Sure, sure. Uh, the band we augmented with Lex Price mm -hmm. on bass and Ian Fitchek played drums. Right. Um, Conrad Snyder mm -hmm. engineered, and Vance Powell mixed it. Oh, great! And then here in Nashville, 
Kevin Sokolnicki, who is uh, works at this studio mm-hmm. a lot, did a lot of the engineering and editing, and and um, and my brother Jordan Lenning also uh-huh. did some editing and engineering, and and then I did whatever you know I, I was doing, and and the band also like Keith the singer does a lot of programming and mm-hmm. stuff, and mm-hmm. and so they had their and some friends of theirs up there that they work with, mm-hmm. uh, Jason Cup, and there was one other guy I can't remember mm-hmm. his name worked from there, and so okay, it was spread out. Cool. You know, some, but it, it sounds more spread out than it actually was. It w- <laughs> so when the band approaches you, well, a few questions even when you're talking about producing versus engineering. So you consciously made the decision to hire another engineer so you could focus on more of the musical side of the project. Is that, or when you're f- forced with that decision, um, and, and I know you can engineer, you're a capable engineer, you, you're nominated for you know a Grammy and you won two Grammys engineering. So when do you decide to hire out an engineer versus just produce? If, you know, I really didn't, usually with some records you know exactly what you want yeah. and what where you're headed. And with that album I wasn't yeah. totally confident that sure. I knew what I was doing. Sure. I didn't well, that tell makes anybody sense. else that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so I hired Ian and Lex to, because those guys are both really good producers oh, okay. themselves. And, and Ian, I brought in to play drums, but Ian's a really good piano player. Gotcha. Lex can play bass, but Lex can play bazooki and mandolin and banjo, right. and uh, and so, I, and so we would get a track with Lex playing bass and Ian mm-hmm. playing drums, and then I would have Lex pick up a bazooki and Ian go to the piano booth, right. and do another pass, and they would play over that. So I just got, and then Conrad's a good producer, and yeah, and so I just felt like I'd, if I surrounded the process with some really smart people, yes. we would. <laughs> We, and that's what makes you a good producer because we'll you're casting yeah. you're casting folks. And so and then so you're working on that record, you bring it back to Nashville after it's been tracked. Mm-hmm. And then it's mixed here. Did you do any overdubs here? We did a lot of overdubs here. All the singing was done here. And it's a pretty they're a vocal group. So there okay. was a lot of singing okay. that happened after the fact and and a lot of guitar overdubs. Um, and those you can do in a home studio setting. I say home studio, but were those done at, at what we did, or? we came back here for a week after tracking, and in the B room uh-huh. next door, uh-huh. Keith and I went in there, and he sang all his lead vocals. Yeah, and then in here, uh, Dan went into that booth mm-hmm. and did all his guitar overdubs. Right, and Great. so, so we had both rooms going, and we were kind of compiling things as it went. And then, after that week, they went back to Philadelphia. And did further background vocals together. Mm-hmm. Oh, and Dan did a lot of background vocals in, in this room too, yeah. and and a few more guitars, and and that kind of it took a few weeks to kind of corral sure. everything and get it. And that and that was what I was going to ask you next is so so now everything's been cut before you send it off to mix. You're you're the producer. Are you um, muting or culling things out of of the arrangements? Yeah, and, sure. Yeah. Okay. A lot. And and I really. Um, Go pretty deep on rough mixes and okay. try to give the mixer right um, an idea, of. A, a really good idea. Where at that point you know what the record's going to be and what you want sure. it to sound like. And sure, um, Vance Powell mixed yeah. this album, Great. and uh, and so I, you know I just did the best roughs I could do without going crazy. Yeah. And and we the way that we did this was because again every like the band's already back in Philadelphia. Right, I was on my way out of town when. Van, Vance's window opened up to do mm-hmm. it. So we worked pretty closely on one song and got really close on mm-hmm. it. And then I left and left Vance alone with it. Right. And he mixed right. the whole rest of the record and then came back and over the course of maybe, it probably took us two days to, to close mm-hmm. th- those mixes. So yeah. maybe just a couple revisions and you're, and you're done with the, Yeah. That's yeah, great. Yeah. And then who mastered that? Just so we can give Andrew a shout Mendelsohn. out to ah, yeah. Andrew at Georgetown. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Awesome. And he did a fantastic job. So. And then, besides that band, you're also working in the country realm as well. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk a little bit about your background, because like I said, your discography is very diverse. Uh, but you told me you're working with a country artist? Yeah, um, Kelly Bannon okay. on EMI Nashville. Okay. And how is that process? Maybe we could compare and contrast the, you know, working with an indie, indie band was, you know, versus a country artist. Um, is it different? Are you looking, are you picking songs, outside songs, or yeah, in the production I mean, role? Yeah, I'm I'm involved with that. Kelly is a great writer, and, uh-huh. and so she has a lot of her own okay. songs that are coming in, and I'm co-writing a little bit with her yeah. on that, but she's also got other great co-writers that are delivering awesome songs. Right. And 
the A and R team with her at EMI are fantastic, and great. so they're they're finding great awesome. stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, do you find it? I mean, do you think that is a modern producer, someone that can once again wear all those hats, writing? producing, engineering, you know, obviously back in the 80s and 90s, there was a division of labor where you were just the engineer, you were just the producer, but do you think that's an asset that you bring as a producer to projects, being able to write and 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 produce and engineer? Yeah, I'd like to think yeah. so, but I don't know, you know, I don't know <laughs> yeah, what, yeah. what is. But you also play on records. Yeah. For, yeah. You know, perform. I think if I have any assets, it's the ability to kind of zoom out and zoom in. Ooh, that's nice. And, yeah. and and try to have a relatable perspective that helps mm-hmm. the artist get through things. I don't think I'm the kind of producer that's going to beat my fists on the table and tell them <laughs> they have to do it a certain way. Or, yeah. You know, I really d- just enjoy helping people realize what they hear in their heads. And, and so, and then you have to also, as a producer, especially in the country genre, when you're trying to make country radio happy, have a sense of com- what's commercial or commercialism. So do you think you just have developed that if you know, no, I have no <laughs> idea what commercial is. I, you know, yeah, I, I, I do my best to make the best music I can make, and and really the only people that are important to please are the people who are in the room while right. we're working. And, That's great. And so whoever shows up yeah. is really important. Right. And, and uh, you know, and I don't. I don't know if that's the most successful way to go sure. about doing it or sure. not, but. Um, Chasing a moving target is no mm-hmm. fun at all. And, yeah. And it can strip all the fun out of it. And and I don't know that you get anything that's any good sure. by doing that, um, except sounding like something else. So Yeah. Well, I mean, you must be able to take an artist's vision and, and take their language and, and then take it to the technical side and also the musical side. I mean, is that just a language you learn over the, the course of the years producing when they say, I want something darker, I want something brighter, I want this happier or sad? Or, and then you can actually apply the technical skills to make that happen? And, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think having an engineering background, I, I see that that's part of the way that I do it. Because mm-hmm. um, everybody's got their own thing. And I, right. I find that when, once I sit down in front of the computer and start really playing with the sounds, is when it starts to take on its own unique shape, and mm-hmm. and, uh, and then I can take that and apply more music to that and start to build something. But, Very cool. But you know, in some ways, the Kelly Bannon stuff was built in a more pop way than the Good Old War stuff, which mm-hmm. is kind of backwards. You would think yeah. a country record would be a little bit more straightforward, but the right. way those Kelly songs were built were from kind of work tapes that turned into demos that mm-hmm. turned into pre-production mm-hmm. demos, and on the you know, some of those things, the drums and bass would be the last thing wow. to get recorded. Wow. And so in that case, are you, um, you're picking a band, you know, the, are you picking a traditional Nashville, you know, five or six guys that get in a room and play together? Or like you said, it's more overdubs. We did pop. two batches of things with her, um, five or six songs each mm-hmm. time. And the first round, just because of the way it came together, Nobody ever played together at the mm-hmm. same time. The second round, I did less building on the front end and had a band come mm-hmm. in, and, and it was a little bit more traditional. Can you compare and contrast those methods? Do you think one is more viable than the next? No, I, no. It was just it had to do more with logistics right. and, and timing, and 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 we. I guess we had a better sense of where we were going because that first batch of stuff we had. Um, we were figuring out what the sound mm-hmm. was. And right. Once we knew what it was, it was easier to go in with the room full of people and get there. So, so once again, speaking to walking the line of commercialism, does the label have to okay that direction before you guys oh, yeah. cut the next six? We only or? cut the next six because they liked <clears throat> the first. I got gotcha. you. Six. Yeah. So that's kind right. of the new model: is they're putting their stamp of approval and then giving you, you know, okay, you can have the budget to do. Sure. You know. Yeah. And the first batch only was approved because of one spec song that was right, done to, right. to see if they liked it and so great um, great all right guys we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back
Welcome back to the producer's room. Once again, our guest is Jason Lenning, and we were just getting into um, how you've worn all these hats, and I want to go back to talk about a little bit about your background for those people that are even considering going to music school and going to school for engineering. You grew up in a musical family, and you grew up in Nashville, is that correct? True. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, your father's a producer, and I know your brothers are musical as well. Yeah. Um, my my dad is named Kyle Lenning, mm-hmm. and uh, has produced countless awesome albums, and, <laughs> and I, I grew up in that environment. There okay. Was, um, there was always a studio in, in our family. Wow. Um, and so from a really young age, was around it. And, and, and um, Did you take it for granted, or did you always uh, try to absorb it? No, it was it cool. <laughs> it, it was really <laughs> it was cool. cool back yeah. Then. Um, and you could tell by the energy of the people in it uh-huh. that they all thought it was cool, mm-hmm. too. And, and, you know, it was a really exciting. Nobody was bummed out about being at work. And, That's cool. Um, I didn't even know that you could be bummed out about being at work until <laughs> later. And, and so it, it, was a, it was a great environment to grow up in. Um, and in Nashville, I think it's a real family town. And uh-huh. so it was, it was kind of best of both worlds because, um, you know, it was, it was, I had a you know, great, great mentor. And yeah, great awesome man. upbringing. And, and uh, it was a good environment. And so I started playing piano when I was eight Mm -hmm. and and then at about 13 um, I got one of those Tascam cassette four track Mm. recorders and and then in Sonic SQ80 like keyboard sequencer (laughs) and a guitar and like that kind of like opened up so much Um, were you thinking about recording at that time or were you playing live with bands or both I was thinking about recording yeah yeah like being able to program something mm-hmm. on the Insonic and then re- put it on the four track and then right. go back and play guitar over it. And, yeah, yeah. And I was never much of a singer and so it was always just instrumental stuff to goof yeah. off with. And um, But just learning about how, how sounds can stack up in a way that that was really fun. And, um, and I mean, at that time, like age 13 to maybe 17, you're discovering so much in life and in music and to be making music at the same time you're trying to learn about music was just a great mm-hmm. constantly recycling ideas sure. and um, productive time. And so when I was, when I got to high school and met all these other kids that were wanted to play in bands and stuff, that was a, I jumped right into right. that. And because we had a studio available to us on, you know, nights and weekends, mm-hmm. we never did shows. Like the whole the point recording. of the band yeah. was to be in the studio, cool. and, and all the guys that I was with, they were totally into that, too. And so we would just go, we would literally sleep at the studio. We would take, you know, those big, thick foam baffles. Right. We would lay those <laughs> down at night a blanket, and yeah. sleep on them and then wow. get up the next morning and put them back up That's and great. start working again. So it was, it was a great time. So that love for being with a band and recording in the studio also is a little bit more recent because you're in a band called The Silver Seas, is that right? Yeah, that's with Daniel Tashin and David Gerke. Um, we formed, really, it's really Daniel's brainchild, mm-hmm. and we started doing that, gosh, almost 15, maybe more years ago, as just kind of a love of making music together, yeah. and it's just, it keeps going. So. <laughs> that's great. Um, and we can check out those albums online as well with mm-hmm. the Silver Seas. Okay, so going back just a little bit. So you uh, grew up in Nashville. Um, like you said, you were recording, playing, learning about music. And then I read that you decided to attend school at Berkeley, right? Berkeley College of Music. I did, yeah. Um, I had gone there uh, when I was 16 for a summer program that they offer. Mm-hmm. Like a, in like recording a, or performance? It, or? Was a, it was more performance. Okay. Um, and they, it's just kind of their summer camp, really, mm-hmm. but it's kind of a recruiting thing for the school. Right. And, uh, and I went there and did that and had a really good experience and, and knew, I kind of already at that point knew what I wanted to do. Um, but I was really encouraged to go to college, and, and, and I'm glad I did. Right. Uh, but I also didn't want to, I ended up going to two different schools before Berkeley mm-hmm. to study all the undergrad stuff. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and that took a year and a half to get all the undergrad credits that I could take, and then I moved to Boston, and 
did you specifically make the decision to get out of Nashville to kind of spread your wings or grow musically or to go to school to party. in Boston? <laughs> yeah. Or you mean to do the just, undergrad? Just, yeah, just do your undergrad because you, did you do it here? No, in my high school girlfriend uh, got into Chapel Hill, ah, okay. which I knew there was no point in even applying Chapel <laughs> Hill for me. And so uh, the closest place I could get into was Greensboro, UNC Greensboro. Right, okay. And, uh, and so I just stayed in North Carolina. The, the roommate that I had in Greensboro... Uh, neither he or I liked Greensboro, and right. so after a year, he, we transferred to NC State. Okay. And then I just had one more semester of credits that I needed to take yeah. before I, I knew I was going to go to Boston mm -hmm. at a certain point. And, and so it begs the question then, did, you, know, you said you were happy that you, that you got your degree. Uh, did that contribute to your professional development as an engineer? And it did, yeah. I mean, I would say my, when I went to Berkeley, I knew I wanted to produce an engineer, and mm -hmm. they have a production and engineering major mm -hmm. there. And, and so I jumped right into that. Um, but I'll tell you, the best experience I got there was in the arranging classes mm. and, and um, really digging into arrangement. Mm -hmm. I, if I could do that again, I would just focus on arranging. Wow. Um, and not because producing an engineering isn't valuable, but, but I knew that I was going to do that. I knew that I was going to learn it mm -hmm. one way or another. And... The, the wealth of information th that is at that school yes. in terms of like right. harmony and theory and arranging is so deep that it's and it's hard to find yeah not there and and that's um, what they always uh, taking another famous producer Quincy Jones as uh, makes him such a great producer is because oh, he yeah. has a sense of what fills up each hole and, and the yeah. instruments aren't stepping on each other and it is just it's an arranging concept yeah you know? and when you learn that like fighting with an acoustic guitar part to get it to speak out over a track. Yeah, trying to EQ some frequency to get it to happen is maybe what you need to do is go recut it with mm -hmm. a capo on and a yep. higher voicing. That learning that kind of stuff was really valuable, and so. So uh, you were in Boston two years or two and a half, two and yeah. a half years, and then moved back to Nashville. Is that mm -hmm. right? And then you just you were assisting. Let's take another step back. You were assisting before you went to Berkeley a little bit. Did a little, you work with like, your dad or? Yeah, I okay. mean, I, I, it was. It was in the summers home from college okay. when I would start um, doing some assisting mm -hmm. and, you know, very lightweight. Sure. You know, not, you know, assisting on overdub sessions. Right. And, um, and then once I was back from, from college and really living here, I really started to dig into it. And so was that, was the before in more of the analog days or? or it was still very much an analog okay. world when I okay. started doing and that. And then you got back and you're like, oh, Pro Tools, they get to apply this it wasn't, stuff. No, like, we were still, an, Pro yeah. Tools wasn't happening then. It, yeah. was, it was a few years into it before. And even then it would be a system that you would transfer something to to edit and then transfer it back to the tape machine once it was edited. Mm -hmm. um, so we were on, you know, we would lock up 224 tracks or we never had them, but a lot of studios had 48-track digital machines. Um, we got into the... When ADATs happened, we got the Tascam version, mm -hmm. like the DA-88. DA yeah, DA-88. So we had that, and then, and then Radar mm -hmm. kind of came around, and that was... Uh, there was a lot of records made on Radar. Yeah. And then... You learned all the Radar shortcuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ones you forget. Yeah. And once Pro Tools... Yeah. Once 24-bit Pro Tools yeah. happened we kind of migrated to everything. And hard drives got big enough and systems got fast enough to be able to have a, a whole record in Pro Tools. Then we started doing everything in there. So I'm sure you learned so many lessons that you could pass on assisting that we don't have enough time in the show, but can you think of just working with all these great engineers in Nashville and producers, you know, two or three tips that maybe you learned, either people skills or engineering skills um, um, on the job as an assistant? I mean, I'm, we could write a book, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, you could. It, it's um, it's it's really hard work. Yeah. Because you are sitting around for hours, and then there's a flurry of five minutes where, you know, if you don't do the right thing, everything's going to blow up. Yes. And, you know, so it's it's just really uh, you've got to be quiet and still, but totally pay attention to everything. And I think the best assistants are the ones that see what you're going to need before you need it. Mm -hmm. Um, and start to recognize your patterns and. That's good. Um. And they're paying attention to everybody's needs in the room and, and just out in front of the ball. And, right. Um, it's a really hard thing to teach. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's like being a great waiter. You know? It's <laughs> exactly. just like just t- they were really aware and and uh, and I was good at it for about two years and then started to and I think why I quit doing it is I started to lose interest in it and I could see myself kind of not as excited about it and and that's did you I feel knew. part of the creative process or was it more kind of nuts and bolts? Did you decide I wanted to be more part of the creative process? Um, yeah, and I was ready to, yeah, I was just ready for a change yeah. and ready to, it was, it was time to kind of take that mm-hmm. step. And, you, and it's a risk for everybody because you, it's a, assisting, if you're good at it, is a real secure gig yeah, and, it, yeah. you know, you're busy all the time and mm-hmm. it's, um, it's rewarding. But it was time for me to, to change and so, uh, so I started just saying no to assisting gigs and letting people know it was available to, for firsting and then, and then did a ton of demo sessions. I mean, one yeah. great thing about Nashville, especially at that time, was that publishing demos were, were right. an awesome place to learn how to engineer. Mm-hmm. Um, you had to be really fast and, and everybody was generally good spirited and nice right. and right. Um, it's, uh, it's low pressure on one level but it's also really high pressure because it moves so quick. And, so how did you move from being an assistant engineer and an engineer into producing? Um, <clears throat> well, coming back from school and living in Nashville, I mean, I lived with the guys that I played in my high school band with. We all moved into a house <laughs> together, and there was four of us in a house that w- the rent was like $625 nice. a month. Nice. <laughs> That's so, Nashville for you. you yeah. Find a deal. So you could work like three days a month and make enough money to pay your rent. And mm-hmm. So I was working more than three days a month, but still, like, I had a lot of free time. And mm-hmm. and because you're assisting around, you, you had access to a lot of studios. Again, on nights and weekends, I could go into mm-hmm. a lot of different rooms. And so I, I would just hear a band I liked and invite them to record them for free. And, yeah. Um, and at a certain point, that uh, turned into an artist that I was actually had a really good rapport with and connection with and he was a really great singer and songwriter named David Mead. Okay. He still is great. And uh and I He's Nas- Nashville based. He's a Nashville based artist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're we're actually stepbrothers now. There's a, there's <laughs> a, when we were working together, we got my mom together with his dad That's and they were yeah. married. Yeah. yeah. So um so yeah, so we started working together and I just produced a bunch of demos for him that ultimately ended up getting signed to RCA out of New York. And uh, and went on to make that record, um, co-produced with Peter Collins. Oh, good. Um, yeah, no, who was fantastic. And so then the David gig led to other producing gigs, and and you just kept on going, right? Yeah, and the Silver Seas was in a lot of ways born out of the work that I did with David because mm-hmm. Daniel liked that record and and had a, a ton of great songs and came to me about playing with him mm-hmm. and we were just going to do some shows and, and over time it, we did do some shows and the personnel in the band changed a little bit here and there but once mm-hmm. we kind of got David Gerke on board and yeah, um, and our bass player at the time was Robbie Harrington and, and so that felt really good and we went into the studio and turned into an album that is just, you know, and that band continues to go. But So you're, you're producing records now at this point in time. Uh, I guess it leads me to my next question. You can do all these things. When do you make the decision to mix a record? Or when do you make the decision to, like we were talking about earlier, hire an assistant? And um, is it just dictated by the project? or? Yeah, I think it's... Like the Good Old War record, I knew that that record, I didn't want it to sound like me. Right. And so, and I knew what I would do with it. And, and I know... You know, sometimes you know what you want and you can still get there, but it's not... Right. I don't know. And I, and I, and I love Vance's mixes. I've never gotten a chance to have him mix anything. Mm-hmm. And I knew that his thing applied to this album would sound exactly like what I wanted. And so that was kind of a no-brainer. And with right. the Kelly Bannon stuff, Reed Shippen mixes all that. And, and again, it's like... It's, it just makes sense to me. And it's also... Some of it is a luxury of just being able to have that, but it's also by the time I get the record to that point, I'm so tired of hearing myself that right. and the opportunity to have somebody who I really respect some fresh ears on it doing something to it that you know, and if it doesn't work, I know I can either go do it or I can sit with them and go through it and get it 
right, which, you know, and usually in two or three revisions, you're, mm -hmm. you're there. And so just yeah. having, having the ability to have that kind of talent yeah. as part of the project is no, that's always... Great. We're going to take a quick break here on the producer's room. We'll be right back. We're going to ask Jason about some of his engineering techniques. Stay tuned. What would a degree from Belmont University mean to you? I'm so proud of you, darling. Maybe it's time you found out. Thanks, Dad. I can't believe I finally did it. Belmont University Adult Degree Program. Finish what you started. Welcome back to the producer's room. Once again, our guest today is Jason Linning. And Jason, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your engineering techniques. You have so many credits and, and great credits engineering. Um, maybe some techniques that you could pass on to our viewers. Um, so let's start with something like vocals, just something real simple, a vocal chain. Um, you know, our, our, I guess our viewers out there are saying, I have a limited budget. What equipment should I invest in? And, and so maybe we can take it from a couple different angles. If, if you walked into a studio and you could pick any vocal chain and then maybe one that would be a budget vocal chain that you might recommend for our viewers. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I... My rule of thumb is to just use the best mic that I have available. Okay. okay. Um, and that's not always the most expensive mic. Um, if you're going to a studio that's got a lot of great choices, you might ask to have three or four set up mm -hmm. and have the singer take a verse and a chorus on each one right. and listen. And you'll know pretty quick what you like mm -hmm. best. I don't mess around too much with preamps and compressors. There's, mm -hmm. there's a few that I like, and if they're around, then I, I use them. And, Go ahead and tell us those. I mean, um, if you... I mean the Neve 1272 okay. is great, simple mic pre that I really like a lot because you can back off the output, mm -hmm. and so you can drive the front end a little bit more, gotcha. and they, the Neve stuff really does something cool when you when you push it. And Does um, the 1272 have EQ on board or not? Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just straight pre. No. Okay. But any of those, right. you know, I mean, if it's a 1073 that's on a desk, yes. you can hold the fader back and get the same effect. Um, so Neve preamps are great. Okay. Mastering Lab preamps are great. Yeah. Um, really, anything that's just robust and not too bright gotcha. sounds good to me. Um, and, uh, are you so you said compressors? You could take them or leave them, but are you? I mean, I use. Are them. you limiting any on the front end before you go into the? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or um, compressing. LA two A's, yeah. eleven seventy sixes. I have a CL one B tube tech cool. that cool. I use a lot. Um, and just taking off what three dB, five nah, dB. You hit it harder. <laughs> a little harder. That. Yeah. Okay. I find that it, the attack and release have a lot more to do with what a compressor sounds like than where the threshold mm, is and how much compression there is. And are is. you timing that, like, you know, some guys time it with the BPM of the song, or are you just kind of watching it as Just a, listen. Just and, listening, um, tweaking. Yeah, but I would say, depending on the instrument, a vocal I like a little bit faster mm -hmm. attack than I do on a drum or on a guitar. Right. Um, and a slower release than I would like on a guitar. Or a drum. So then it begs the question of the budget, you know, chain. Let's say a viewer has a thousand dollars to, you know, spend on a mic, a preamp, and a let's say a mic and a preamp. We'll, we'll take it from there. Um, so you're suggesting maybe go with a condenser mic uh, if you had to pick one. If mic, I had right? one microphone yeah. and a thousand dollars, I'd get a Shure SM7. That's great. That's great advice. And yeah. The three hundred fifty bucks. Yeah. And they sound really good. I agree. Um, and spend the rest of the money on the preamp. Yeah. But you need a compressor with an SM7. Okay, okay, um, that's good advice as well, yeah. so. Good, and then um, well, let's talk about something else. Uh, we don't want to get too involved with drums because we could go forever on all those mics, but let's talk about a, your guitar player, right? So maybe some of your favorite uh, mics for a guitar amp and how you might approach a guitar yeah. recording. Um, electric guitar. Electric guitar, there's some ribbon mics that sound really good. I like um, I like a condenser and a dynamic mm. together. Mm -hmm. um, a Shure SM57 or the uh, Sennheiser, what is it, a 421? 421 or the oh, little square oh, the one. square one, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you have it, a 409 and a U67 
on electric guitar, great. Are you using the 67 right on the cab or as a room mic or up right it on the cab? It just depends on yeah. what you want, but I, I'll get right up on it. They, yeah. I just, a couple of years ago, somebody showed me something to do with a 67 that I'd never tried is just to not to go through a preamp. Interesting. And push it into an 1176 yeah. directly wow. and use the it's limiter for gain. Gain, yeah. And it's really clean and loud. And, and a lot of the clipping that you get from a 67 that's getting hit too hard is happening at the mic pre. So wow. if you've got something really loud, just stick a 67 on it and go right into a compressor. Are you speaking to two mics on the guitar cabinet, then it almost begs on the mixing end. Are you a multi-mic guy where you can set up two or three mics and then mix together to, to EQ it that way? Or, I mean, is that what you're going for when you use a condenser? Mm -hmm. in a no, that just sounds better. Okay. Like, I, anytime I put a dynamic and a condenser on the same speaker, getting that right always sounds better to me than just having one. Right, that makes there. sense, yeah. And and I don't go too crazy with panning or with having one mic represent the top end and one mic represent the low end. It's just right. And I guess one more question that that begs is phase. And I know some engineers are just so freaky about phase, they'll literally spend a whole day. I mean, how far do you go in that direction? Do you, Are you checking all the I hit the phase button <laughs> and, and whichever if one sounds better, it stays. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, good. We can always move yeah. it on the back end, too, if you needed to. Okay, good. Any yeah. other, I mean, I loved your, your tip that you gave earlier about the capo on the acoustic guitar, but any other specific techniques that you have developed through the years? Well, when you talk about phase, one thing I've noticed yeah. as a mixer, a lot of times I'll get stuff that's sent to me that's got a bass DI and a bass right. amp. And I notice that more than with guitars, because the guitars are hit, get, those mics are getting Pretty hit close. at the same time. Yeah. But with a DI and an amp on the bass, it's like a few milliseconds. There's, or, there can be some yeah. significant time. The DI is always getting there first. Are you moving and those in the box? Yeah, the what I discovered was I use the delay compensation engine yeah. to bring the amp signal to the left. Okay. You know, okay, earlier, right. to match it. And I'll just find a waveform where I can see and measure that distance in samples. Right. And then on the amp side, put in a negative number. Right. Of whatever, however many samples it is on the delay compensation. This is in Pro Tools. And I hope we're not going too deep for our viewers. Uh, if you don't know about what the phase stuff that Jason's talking about, you can look up constructive and destructive interference uh, with regards to phase and phase shift online. And I think it's a good idea what you're talking about in Pro Tools. So how do you measure between the, the peaks of the waveforms or do you kind of eye it and then use your delay compensation to get those lined up? Yeah, or? like you'll see if this is the waveform of the DI, right, and over here is the waveform of yes. the amp. I'll put the cursor here and drag it to here and measure how many samples. It'll show yeah. you the length of that selection. Wow. And then I just plug that number, mm -hmm. a negative version of that number, into right. the amp signal and it moves And it, it should over. sound fuller for our viewers. I mean, it does, when that's things are in it's surprisingly a big deal. That's right. That's why I even bring it up because yeah. like it really does give you a lot of more better tone. And and also when I'm mixing a project, I do it in, in there because if I'm getting a ten five or ten song project or whatever, mm -hmm. usually that's consistent number the mm -hmm. delay conversation. Right. So when I when the songs get prepped for future songs and a I template, import them, yeah, it's already yeah. in there. And so it. So that let's let's move on to mixing because you were going there. So are you mixing in Pro Tools and Logic and uh, Nuendo? Pro Tools. Okay. And about maybe two years ago, I switched entirely to in the box. I was doing a lot of stuff stemmed out and spread out on a desk. And is that for recall or just ease of? You know, it really came down to I was doing a lot of mixes in this room, mm -hmm. and I have the other room, mm -hmm. and there was a project that I. I couldn't get into this room to do it, and I had to do it in the mm -hmm. other room. And, and so I just made, and the other room doesn't have, that room is, has to be in the box. And yeah. so I just was kind of forced to deal with it. And, yeah. and once I dug into it, I, I kind of quit missing the analog yeah. stuff. And no. So well, let's talk about some of the, your favorite plugins. Are you using the UA stuff, Wave stuff? Um, there's so much to talk about there. Yeah. But. I, I use kind of my go to. EQ is the Fab Filter Pro yeah. Q. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then, and it's real. What's the word? Is it pretty it, transparent? It or is. It doesn't, it add doesn't a lot really of color. have any character. Right. But you can zero in on what you can bend the sound in whatever way you want. And right. so, um, 
And then for character, it's usually UAD mm -hmm. plugins. I think they just sound great. They do yeah. a really good job. The Neve or the what? What I mean, there's so many. There's the Massive Passive in there. There's um, the any particular ones. Yeah, or? I like the Fairchild yeah. compressor. Yeah. I just got that Summit. Uh, yeah, the Summit, Summit compressor. Over, yeah. That's really good. They're always coming out with new um, stuff to keep up with. Yeah, well, <laughs> Vance just mixed the good old worker, and he's got all this beta testing stuff that they so he's got oh. things you can't buy yet um that i'm really excited for when they, <laughs> they release them it's good that's good um um reverbs that's one thing that i'm still fighting is outboard reverbs versus internal but um have you found ones that you like yeah i, or I have a few i i use the uad uh emt 140 plate yeah, yeah. i use altiverb mm -hmm. for anything shorter than that gotcha and that's uh good. And I even like um, Echo Boy, yeah. the Sound Toys thing. There's, if you set the diffusion and the size, mm -hmm. turn those up, then it kind of spreads out, and you can get a really great short. That's cool. Um, kind of thing happening. That's cool. Um, so as far as compression, are you using compression as color? Are you using compression as compression, or uh, all of the above? And then, do you use any saturation type of plugs to? Yeah, I, I use Decapitator a yes. lot. I lean on that's Another even sound, almost sound toys. Yeah, yeah. Um, for saturation, I use Decapitator and Tapehead, mm -hmm. and the UAD Studer eight hundred. Yeah, um, yeah. But for the but Decapitator mo of those three, that's most of the time, and that's even kind of an EQ for me. Cool. Um, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I mean, distortion is EQ. Yeah. Are you are you running those? I'm going real technical now. Hopefully, our, we're not losing our viewers. But are you running those as augses or inserts as far as your uh, saturation and? It depends o on the lead vocal. I'll often have a parallel yes. compressor and a parallel decapitator. Okay, gotcha. And just play with the blend of those three things. Right. Um, I do a lot of parallel compression, and that's good. And and I guess. The way I use parallel compression is as a way to create presence and sustain mm -hmm. in instruments. And then I might also have more of a character kind of compressor gotcha. on the actual instrument yes. before it feeds to the parallel. Right. That makes sense. And then speaking of feeding, let's talk about some bus compression while we're at it. Do you, are you bus compressing drums? Are you obviously your bus com you're compressing the master? Let's talk about all the plugins you use there as well. Because of the amount of parallel compression yeah. I'm doing, I'm not doing a lot of bus compression before the two mix. Okay, gotcha. Um, sometimes I'll subgroup the drums and put a little decapitator right. on just all of that. them up just a hair um, or something. It just depends. Yeah. Maybe half the time I'm doing that. Okay. And then Master Bus L2 or L2007 or Fab Filter? They they make. Have you tried their? I uh, haven't tried theirs yet. Compressor. Um, the Master Bus. I have this. I haven't found one compressor that sounds awesome to me. Yeah. But I find that if you stack a few up Ooh. and do a little bit, take with each a little one, off. Yeah. It it can be pretty cool. And so I'll use the first compressor in the two mix chain as is either going to be the 33609 UAD Neve mm -hmm. or that Summit mm -hmm. or sometimes the Fairchild. Right, right. Just, I just kind of, depending on the record, kind of just find the one that's best. Yeah, that's great. And then I have kind of a standard thing, and then I'll go to the Fab Filter to kind of do some subtractive EQ after mm -hmm. that and just kind of carve out. Well, that's always the question. Are you, yeah. are you a booster or are you a cutter on Both. EQ? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I like the Fatso Junior, the yes. UAD Fatso Junior, um, does a thing. Is that different than your saturation plugins? I mean, does it do it? I use that on the two bus okay. as a compressor. Okay. Um, Good. But I don't hit it very hard. Right. None okay. of these are getting hit real hard. Right. And then, um, and then as a limiter for the very end, just for the riff, I don't mm -hmm. print the master through a limiter. I'll go with I like the Slate mm -hmm. FGX. Yes, heard a lot of good things about these. It's great, but then it sometimes it just doesn't work, and yeah. and in those times I'll go to the Massey L two thousand seven or the L two yeah. waves. Great. All right. Well, that's enough technical stuff. Uh, next segment, we're going to ask you a few random questions, and also get into a little bit about your discography and listen to some of those. So, all right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Music is the most valuable thing that there is. People expect music to be free. It's like the air. Every single thing you hear comes from the mind and the heart of a songwriter. The only way we 
we are able to make a living is by convincing people that this won't exist without us and it is necessary. ASCAP makes sure that we have a voice. Welcome back to the producer's room. I'm Dave Tuff, and our guest today is Jason Linning. Once again, thanks for having us here at The Compound. Thank you. This next segment of the show is an interesting one. We ask five random questions and see if you can answer them. <laughs> so uh, let's start with this one. Neil Young or Bob Dylan? And we leave it open-ended. Man, it's tough. Probably Neil Young. Okay. Yeah. And your reasoning? Um, swagger. Okay. I think, I think that's good enough. Yeah. Um, best bar slash restaurant in Nashville? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> For our out-of-town folks that come visit us, they probably want to go down to Tootsie's anyway, right? But uh, Right now, I'm uh, loving 404 Kitchen in the Gulch. Ooh, I've never been there. That's really, really good. Wow. What kind of food? Great food. Yeah, I don't know. It's you know, Europe. It's continental, you know, European based food, but it's just fantastic. It's really good, and their their bartender is awesome too. Wow, we'll have to check that out. Yeah. Uh, in the Gulch, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Eleven seventy six or CL one B. Tube Tech. <laughs> okay. But yeah. If you're gonna have one compressor, that, yeah. For me, that's the one. Okay. Good. Um, Desert Island song slash album. The Pixies Doolittle. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah. All right. And then finally, uh, we already kind of answered this, but vocal mic, solid state, or tube? Tube. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's our five on yeah. the fly. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much uh, for answering those questions. You did really well on Thank Five you. on the Fly. And our next segment is called On the Record, where the producer kind of plays some tracks and we talk about them for our listeners and viewers. Um, so you've done so much stuff in your discography, it's hard for me to pick, but let's start recent. Let's start with the good old war uh, stuff that you did in Nashville recently. And you said this single or this album is out now? Um, it's not out as of today, but probably by the time by the this time is airing, we're, okay, we'll, we're, we're air. very close. All I right. think I'm safe to uh, sure. share this. Yeah. Sure, let's do it. This is called, I'll tell you a little bit about it before I start. Sure, go for this it. This is a tune called Never Gonna See Me Cry, and it's uh, was written with Daniel Tashin uh -huh. from the Silver Seas, and, and the two guys from the band and I got mm. together at Daniel's house and wrote this and cut it in Nashville. The first thing that drew me in was some of the percussion that's going on and also that snare sound. Is that a, did you guys do samples, real drums on this? It's or? both. Okay. There's a lot of, a lot of this record we started with some programmed stuff in our work tapes and demos and then went and would leave them in while the, and the band would play to that. Okay, great. Um, but I think like one of the acoustic guitars and some of the drums were from the demo. Okay, oh, so that's good advice. Yeah. Make good demos and you can use some of it for the best. Oh yeah, that happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and then we added, to, but like the bass is wet. Oh yeah. And, and the, most of the drums, you know, once it gets going is the end. So you said um, background vocal wise, those sounded really nice. Uh, you cut those in Nashville. And who's singing background on this song? It's the guys. It's okay, the guys. Band. Okay. Yeah, we just go in an overdub. Nice harmonies, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of singing on this whole record. So on your pre-production, I guess it depends on the artist, but are you doing Besides writing some of the songs, are you doing some editing or shaping of the songs in any way? Or, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely, it's, okay. it's and it's constantly in flux until okay. it goes to the mixer. Right. Um,
<laughs> yeah. I love Vance's mix on this. I mean, this, this is a, a great example of why yeah. I called him for this. So, so I guess the question begs itself there. Did you cut with those effects or did Vance add those later? Um, on like on the guitar? That was mostly already there. Yeah. I mean, I mean he's adding compression okay. and some space around it. So whatever's there is getting bigger. Yes. Um, and in some cases, you know, like all the reverbs on the vocals and stuff is is Vance. Nice. There's some more harmonies for you. Yeah. But it's nice. I mean, obviously, I'm telling, not telling you anything you don't know, but it, the build, the verses are coming down and the, the courses are growing. It's nice. All right. Do you mind if we take it to something completely yeah. different? We can. Sure. Uh, you want to? Can you play some of the Kelly stuff? I'm not sure if, how recent some of the stuff is, but yeah. I wanted to show the breadth of your discography and uh, sure. So this next project, what uh, label is she on here in Nashville? Kelly's on EMI Nashville. Okay. All right. This song is out on XM. And the name of this one is called Smoke When I Drink. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. I'm always asking the drum question, so you can see I'm coming from a drum sure. background. But once again, it interests me on this one how much uh, you're combining real percussion versus samples. And is there both on this? There is. This well? is more drumming. But okay. Yeah, but there's a lot of augmentation to the drums that were programmed. Even the reverse kind of shh, the snare yeah, drum. Yeah, that's all. And we were listening to. I played everybody the stroke by Billy Squire. Yes, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah that's a good reference. Um, I like that. And then my dad, this session, my dad, I got to hire my dad, the engineer. Oh, wow, that's press, so great. It's really fun. We've yeah. been doing some of that in the last year. No, just year. trading off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I grew up engineering for him, but I never, I don't do it now. But it's been yeah. fun for me to hire him <laughs> as a tracking engineer. All that hope back on in a blank. Keep telling myself I only smoke when I drink. So speaking to making the label happy. When you bring a song like this to them, are they gonna say it has some connotations that shouldn't be on radio well, they, or any problems? They found with it? this. Okay, um, well, good. But yes, <laughs> and and what now? Now the connotation is that it's not, you know, it's well, it, it's yeah, it's hard hard to make everyone happy, you know. Yeah. But if, especially if you're breaking new ground, but baritone or what was that? Where the tune tune it was up? a resonator. Ah, um, it's Brian Sutton and. He just tuned it down to get it yeah. low enough and then brought it back up with a tune thing. This is Reed Shippen mixing. Yeah. This one. Tremolo to him? Guitar? I'm hearing some interesting things yeah. on guitar. Well, Jed Hughes is co producer on all this stuff. Okay. Like he's playing a ton of guitars on this. This is Jed and Johnny Duke. Okay. Are, we're on the tracking session. Um, so a lot of that, I mean, that's. There's another tuning it down. Anything acoustic yeah. is usually uh, Brian, but the electrics are all yeah. Jed and Johnny. Um, so one question, once again, for, for country radio is, uh, when is it too much? When are you adding too many elements, and how do you know when it's done? You know, why not add a steel, you know, to play devil's advocate, or why not add, you know, this or that, yeah. or 15 acoustic guitars? Or you know, there... Um, you don't, really, but... but yeah. uh, I usually put too much on it and then start taking things away. Right. And and I guess th we put steel guitar on some things and and it immediately on a couple of time moments Kelly would react being like that's not me. I, right. You know, and so we would take it off. So it goes back to to the artist's vision yeah. and making the And there's places where there's steel guitar and it's just right. And so yeah. I think it just depends on yeah. 
on what it is, but we are trying to do something that's, you know, fits in the country world, but isn't yeah. um, standard. And so, very cool. Let's do one more. We probably only have time for one more. And uh, you want to do some Matt Carney, some pop? Or sure. Would that be? Yeah. And when did you produce uh, Matt's record? This is, is that two, three years ago. Now. Okay. And which record, or what song? And which uh, this is a song called Ships in the Night. Okay. And uh, off the album Young Love. Like ships in the night, you keep passing me by. We're just wasting time. What's that intro effect there? Is that, or instrument, I should ask? Is it a piano? It's a piano. It's kind of a static piano. In the night, letting cannonballs fly. See what you mean, and it turns to a fight. Fists fly from my mouth as it turns. Once again, I'm attracted to your drums. I just keep going there. But uh, this, the, you, th I mean, this beat is um, Josh Crosby and Robert Marvin. Okay. They or maybe Robert. This was what started as a Robert track. Um, the way this stuff evolved is so different from anything yeah. I've ever done. There were a lot of people involved with it. I, Robert Marlin and I co-produced. So did the, what was it a case when the demo became the master kind of and it just kept oh, going? Oh, the Matt stuff, it's always that yeah. way. Yeah, okay. Yeah. There's very little, let's go in and record. It's, you're kind of always, you're always writing. Right. It's like the writing doesn't stop until, whereas most of the time you write mm -hmm. and then you record and yeah. then you finish it. And with Matt's records, it's just yeah. constant writing and changing. And, um, we would have songs on this record that would be completed, fully produced, vocals done, everything, mm -hmm. through the end of the second chorus, and then it would just stop. And wow. And it'd be like, what, <laughs> what are we gonna do here? And is this one you mixed or wrote? Or? Manny Mora can do this. Oh. Yeah. It's not bad. Ooh, I'm Manny a huge on there. <laughs> Yeah. I, I love his book. Second plane had to pack and you cramps and I was slate headed to a red carpet. They won't know my name. Riding in silence. All that we want to say about to board when you call on the phone. You say I'm sorry I'll be waiting at home. Feels like we're burning this out on our own. Trying to find a way down a road we don't know. Are all the uh, O's backgrounds, how many are there on all those? Or is that just a delay that I'm hearing? I can... Some, Gosh, I don't even remember. That's all right. There's yeah. some stuff in the background. But it sounds like you guys doubled a lot of vocals, which brings me to another question. I'm always curious about when does a producer decide to double the vocals and when, when do you just kind of leave it by itself? Certain um, voices? or It just depends on the voice. But I mean, on a pop record, it's it's rare to not double. And, right. And, and, and even triple right. the lead vocal. And it's kind of a standard thing is to have the lead vocal in the middle and then a double yeah. and a triple on the sides. Right. And, I think where it varies is how much do you tune it and line them up right. to where it's, is it going to sound like a, a group of people or is it going to sound like sure. one big voice? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, with Matt and all the choruses, it was always double and triple and then usually double the harmonies. Anytime mm. there's a harmony, it would be double. Well, that part right there is a, was, it's kind of a sub hook of the... Yeah. I think that was from the earliest demo work tape from when they very first started the song. Yeah. This is a classic example of what are we going to do? What are we going to do course. right here? Yeah. <laughs> so are you guys writing those hooks on the session or is that something like you said he came in with before some of the the sign I'm I'm calling them sig hooks. As far as vocally, I mean the the falsetto <coughs> thing and the O's, yeah. and, or is he coming with the, up with those? This on was the started. Track? I don't know because I Robert and Matt started this song yeah. early, early before I yeah. was even involved in the record. So I don't know how that piece of it shaped. Right. Out. Um, but the verses and and the kind of completed chorus, mm -hmm. um, the you know none of the top line was complete. Right. Early on, it kind of evolved over time. Man, that's great. Um, you said one thing that I wanted to ask you about. You said top lining. So is the track already done before M Matt writes to it? Or is it, like you said, an evolving process there? It, it evolves and it happens differently every okay. song. Um, the way I think this one came together was a track that Robert had started with and Matt came in and they 
got to a point with it, and then Matt would leave with it and work on the lyrics and come back and revisit it. And, and, and his process is so much about the poetry that he's bringing to it. Mm -hmm. So he really takes a lot of time with that. And, and once the chorus gets kind of locked in, he'll, he'll go really deep on the verses and, and spend a lot of time changing them and rethinking yeah. them and, and uh, just kind of playing with it until it, he molds it into what it is. We could be here another hour, but I really appreciate you playing that for us. That does it for this episode of The Producer's Room. Once again, I want to thank Jason Lenning. Thanks so much for having us out here. Thank you. And uh, we hope to uh, see you again. Maybe we'll, we'll have you back. <laughs> I'd love to. A lot All of right. fun. Thank you so much. Thanks. Once again, you're watching The Producer's Room, and we'll see you next episode.